When you read about the political history of Illinois, you often see the word corruption. For instance, from January 1961 until January 2009, Illinois citizens elected eight different men to be their governors. Four of those eventually went to prison, all convicted after they were out of office. Robert E. Hartley has written 11 books about the politicians of Illinois, including one titled Power, Purpose, and Prison. Mr. Hartley writes that these men met their downfall under different circumstances. He asks, where did they go wrong? And were they able to recover self-respect in spite of their punishment? We assume you're here because you enjoy listening to C-SPAN's podcasts. If you're a regular listener, please consider supporting our nonprofit operation so we can continue to bring you quality public affairs podcasts like these. Visit cspan.org slash donate to learn more. Robert Hartley, why did you call your book Power, Purpose, and Prison when you were writing about Illinois governors? Well, I thought that covered uh, most of the governors in some way or another uh, from uh, about 1940 uh, up to uh, the book uh, covered up to about 2003. And I just felt that if you looked at all of those governors during that time, they fit into those three categories pretty well. Because I'm going to ask you a lot about the ones that went to prison, let me start by, though, asking you who of all the governors you wrote about you think was the most successful? Oh, I think uh, Jim Thompson was. Uh, he served 14 years. Uh, politically, he certainly was successful. And I think his, uh, his, term, his terms as governor were successful as well. Uh, there were some other good governors, but I think uh, Thompson pretty much stands above them all. What makes a good governor from your experience? Well, I think uh, someone who uh, can operate politically um, and can, uh, can get po uh, policy uh, issues passed, uh, working with, as, as Thompson did, with a Democratic legislature most of his time, he was able to get uh, quite a th few things through. In fact, uh, they always said that he was elected as a Republican and he operated as a Democrat because he was able to cross the line and get things done. So how many books have you written about Illinois politics? Um, Twelve. Why? Well, I'm, I'm addicted to Illinois politics. Um, and uh, it started when I was working uh, in the newspaper business in Illinois, and I became um, fascinated by it and uh, had the interaction with a number of politicians and sort of one thing led to another. I had a mentor who uh, helped me greatly, Bob Howard, who was a longtime uh, reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he wrote a couple of big books as well, and he encouraged me to write books. Where did you work in Illinois? I worked in East St. Louis. I worked for the same organization all the time I was in the newspaper business, and I started uh, on the newspaper in East St. Louis, and then uh, moved to Decatur, which was the home office of the organization. And I ran the newspapers there morning and evening, and then later became a corporate editor for that company. How many of your books have been self-published? I uh, self-published uh, three. And then who published the rest? The, uh, uh, the Southern Illinois University Press um, for most of them. So what is, as a journalist, as a writer, what's your objective? Uh, I'm to, I hope to tell uh, history, uh, stories of history uh, that I think have been overlooked or will not be covered by other people. And uh, so I would think I was always driven uh, by a mission to, uh, to write about uh, Illinois politics in a balanced manner. Um, and uh, even though I, I knew a lot of these people, Democrats and Republicans as well, 
and um, and so I that's I think that was my mission, and that was why that is what has driven me, uh, looking for uh, areas of politics in Illinois that has either been ignored or nobody cares about. Describe Illinois for somebody that's never been there. <laughs> well, uh, Illinois is a big state, and, and uh, I lived there for uh, 17 years. Uh, it's a um, an agricultural state, uh, downstate for the most part, industrial as well. Of course, there's Chicago and all of the politics that uh, comes out of out of uh, Chicago, uh, and uh, it is a uh, it has a tremendous overall a tremendous history. Uh, and uh, so that uh, it doesn't take much to get uh, uh, in, engrossed in the history. I just branched it out into uh, politics. It's a, it was a great place to live and to work when I was there. Where are you now? I live in Winfield, Kansas, where I have retired uh, after uh, living in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, and Washington State and Colorado and Arizona, and I ended up back here where I am a native of Winfield. How corrupt is Illinois politics? Well, it is a part of Illinois politics to the bone, um, and it uh, it goes back far beyond uh, uh, be anything that I have done research on. Uh, I started my research on uh, <clears throat> on their politics and in, uh, in 1936, 34, uh, and followed it then from that point on. And everywhere I turned, every, uh, every governor who served, with a few exceptions, um, had some, uh, some lean, had got in trouble some way with their uh, governing or with their personal lives. And, uh, and into several, five of those then, five of those governors in that time period I uh, ended up in prison. Um, there was one who was uh, accused of uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of avoiding uh, uh, tax of evading taxes, and he was acquitted. And there was one a governor who uh, was accused of a lot of things by the press and in a campaign, but was never uh, prosecuted. So it it stretches from uh, really from about 1940 all the way to 2009. I'm old enough to remember a, a big name as I was growing up, Otto Kerner, governor from 61 to 68. Why did he go to prison? Um, uh, Otto Kerner um, he was, a, was a governor during uh, a period in which in Chicago particularly, racetracks were big business. And, um, and he, was, uh, he was governing uh, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with the blessing of uh, Mayor Daley at the time. And uh, during uh, his uh, service, uh, he um, was approached um, through uh, intermediaries. Uh, he was approached to uh, buy some stock in a racing track operation run by Marge Everett was her name. And she was a big deal in, uh, in horse racing in Chicago. And uh, she offered him uh, stock in her company at a, um, what turned out to be a ridiculously low price. Uh, then with, uh, in, in, uh, in, in her, what she was, this was a, um, a, um, <clears throat> a proposal uh, she wanted something from Kerner, and uh, so it was a pay for pay, pay for play, and um, and the deal was that um, he could sell the stock back to her for a profit, significant profit. But uh, she wanted uh, some help from him. For example, the state of Illinois controlled the dates of race tracking, and uh, they were set by uh, the administration. And she wanted some favorable dates uh, from uh, from Kerner, and she also wanted some legislation that helped uh, her profits, and uh, and he did that. And he uh, with uh, with help from friends in the administration, 
uh, he bought the stock. He, uh, he, he, he sold it back to her, made a profit of about $150,000, which today doesn't sound much, but in the 1960s, it was a lot of money. And, um, and so uh, then uh, the, uh, the federal government was conducting uh, an investigation of horse racing in uh, Illinois. And uh, throughout that uh, investigation, they discovered this transaction. I'm going to come back to these governors, but I want to go through them and get the brief explanation on why they went to prison. Why did Dan Walker, who was governor from 1973 to 77, go to prison? He did not uh, do. He did not go to prison for anything that happened during his governorship. Uh, he this way all this happened after he was governor. And he um, he uh, he enjoyed the high life and living the high life. Uh, and uh, after he was governor, and uh, his wife, uh, he and his wife were very socially active in Chicago. Uh, he uh, he tried uh, uh, practicing law, and that didn't work out. And then he went into businesses, a couple of businesses that made some big money for him and took some of that money and bought his way into a savings and loan in the suburbs of Chicago. And uh, then he, uh, he, he was running the savings and loan. And it was during that time and during the manipulation of money that was flowing from loans uh, to the savings and loan, everything was in getting in trouble in that time of the, uh, time of year, a time of uh, history when savings and loans ran into trouble. And he began manipulating uh, the resources that he had for personal use. And the federal government, uh, of course, controlling and regulating savings and loans, uh, were looking into those, uh, those uh, activities that he undertook. And uh, they charged him, uh, took him and indicted him for a, a number of, uh, of, of uh, uh, charges and uh, and then uh, he uh, he did not go to a trial. He uh, he he uh, pleaded guilty on the advice of his attorney, and uh, he thought he was going to get uh, probation at the uh, at the at the worst, and they, he ended up with a sentence of six years in prison. Why did George Ryan now? Kerner and Walker were Democrats. Ryan was a Republican. Why did he go to prison? Um, he had uh, he had a history in the state government as a deal maker. He started out uh, in the uh, in the legislature in the House of Representatives uh, in the uh, <clears throat> prior to eight, in 1980. Uh, he was he became a speaker for uh, uh, two years in the 80s. Then he and T Jim Thompson teamed up, and he joined Thompson as lieutenant governor, and he uh, had uh, a free hand to uh, cut deals. Uh, he was a, he was a he liked people, and he didn't want to make anybody mad, and he couldn't say no. And uh, soon he was uh, named, and Thompson helped him uh, get to be secretary of state, and that's where he met his downfall. Uh, and he ended up uh, ended up uh, with payoffs. He ended up with uh, with money, uh, campaign money. Uh, he ended up uh, creating a, a corrupt operation uh, or permitting it around him with a bunch of uh, people that were friends of his that he brought into the administration. He ran for governor in 1998, and it was beginning to catch up with him then. There was an investigation going on into the time he was Secretary of State in which uh, the uh, feds were looking at how um, uh, truck, uh, truck drivers licensing was being manipulated and there were payoffs involved in that. And while it didn't directly hit uh, uh, Ryan at that time, it was going on around all over him, and the, and the government, I think, felt that he could not have been Secretary of State or Governor and not known about it and what was going on. <clears throat> he was uh, uh, he was elected in '98, 
and uh, and sir and and he already the rumors were flying that uh, there were investigations and he was in trouble, uh, but he was elected and uh, and he uh, served a uh, uh, one term, but before that term was over, uh, they had brought in uh, with the new uh, uh, with the new administration in D.C. They brought in a new U.S. attorney um, in uh, in uh, Chicago who was a, a most aggressive man, and he um, picked up on this uh, on what Ryan had been doing, and the first thing you knew, he was indicted uh, by a federal grand jury, and he went to a trial. Of course, he denied anything illegal. He, he didn't uh, he didn't uh, argue about doing some manipulation or some deals, but he contended that he didn't do anything illegal, but he was convicted and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Rod Blagojevich was the governor January 2003 until January 2009. You don't write a lot about him in the book, but why did he go to prison? Well, first of all, uh, during his time as governor, uh, he, the legislature, impeached him and the uh, and in convicted him uh, so that uh, and then there was a federal investigation of corrupt practices and he was charged with that and so he lost the job as governor by being impeached and convicted and then he went to prison for the corrupt uh, activities how much did he get involved in the whole selling of supposedly of the senate seat when Barack Obama became president, well, he wanted to. Uh, he wanted to do that. I don't think he ever success, succeeded in selling anything, um, but uh, he was trying, always trying to manipulate uh, the uh, his own his own business, getting something for him and for some other people who were friends of his. Why did Donald Trump commute his sentence? You know, I don't know. I didn't do a lot of research uh, for, <clears throat> on uh, Bogoyevich uh, because uh, uh, that wasn't for the book, and uh, and I couldn't answer that question. I don't know why. Uh, I think he felt uh, maybe he felt that uh, uh, that Bogoyevich had been uh, had served enough time. An Illinois political figure by the name of Dennis Hastert. He was the Speaker of the House. Went to prison. How much about that case do you know? Uh, not a great deal. Then there is somebody I'm sure you know about, even though you don't write about him in this book, a guy named Mike Madigan, uh, who was the longest, one of the longest serving public officials in, in a leadership position anywhere in the country who is going to stand trial next year. Did you have anything to do with him when you were covering Illinois? I did not, although um, I watched that uh, his takeover of the legislature very carefully because I was writing about uh, Illinois uh, during uh, the time he was. Uh, <clears throat> he really started taking over in the early uh, 1980s, and uh, and so um, he had uh, the people that I wrote about. Let's say Thompson and Jim Edgar, who followed him as governor. Uh, they both dealt with uh, with legislator was led with a legislature that was uh, dominated by Democrats. So they had to deal with him in order to get things through, and uh, so he was a factor in uh, looking at the performance of uh, of Thompson and Edgar, and uh, and and I think probably as well uh, with uh, Ryan. So, so that I couldn't ignore him in terms of that. Uh, and uh, in their oral histories uh, that uh, Thompson and uh, Edgar did, uh, they talked uh, quite a bit about their negotiations with him, with Madigan, in order to get things passed through. In this book, you start off with this paragraph. While looking through the several published biographies of Illinois governors, I was reminded of vocalist Peggy Lee's iconic song recorded in 1969, Is That All There Is? What were you getting at? Well, um, is there, was, there, was there something there 
uh, that uh, nobody knew about or, uh, or didn't know the details of it. And um, for example, uh, I wrote uh, one of the first books that I wrote uh, uh, on Illinois politics uh, after I retired from uh, newspaper business was about Paul Powell, who was a uh, the master manipulator of the legislature, and uh, and he was uh, and I wrote a book about him. <clears throat> excuse me, wrote a book about him, and uh, d dug into his uh, past and he had. Uh, he had died in 1970, and I wrote the book 20 some years later. But uh, we we knew an awful lot about Paul Powell and all of his manipulation and money that he made in uh, in payoffs and uh, and uh, doing favors, passing legislation. Uh, he was a he was a speaker of the House for three terms, three times, and then he was a minority leader, a Democratic minority leader for six or more times while he was in the legislature. And he ran things. There was just no question about it. But not people didn't know a lot until he died exactly what he had been doing. And, uh, and I wrote the first book then, and maybe the only book up to this point, about him and what we knew as a result of uh, the investigations of the FBI and, uh, and Illinois uh, services as well after he had died, <clears throat> and that that for me sort of said, okay, if that happened with Powell and his cohorts, uh, what what happened with these others? And it was shortly after Powell died that uh, <clears throat> that Ryan entered the legislature and began his series of deal making. So there was a kind of a continuum that went on throughout of that. Uh, the four <clears throat> governors we've been talking about, it's interesting that they all went to different federal prisons. Otto Kerner went to Lexington. Dan Walker went to Duluth, Minnesota. George Ryan ended up in the Terre Haute Federal Prison. Rod Blagojevich in the Inglewood, Colorado Prison. And Denny Hastert in the Rochester, Minnesota Prison. Uh, he wasn't the governor, but he was the Speaker of the House. Otto Kerner was a big name because of something called the Kerner Commission, and that was known nationwide. What was that all about, and and was he? What did the rest of the country think of him at that time? Um, the president was Lyndon Johnson at that time, and the riots that were uh, um, making headlines across the country and the West Coast, Detroit, uh, places like that, where people were uh, dying. And, uh, and uh, riots were happening and the police were involved. And uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted somebody, uh, he was feeling the heat, uh, and he wanted somebody to conduct some investigations and, uh, and look into what was happening and why it was happening. And he appointed Kerner to do this. And Kerner then prepared uh, a report, uh, which uh, uh, for the most part exonerated uh, uh, any uh, of the of Lyndon Johnson uh, activities, but he uh, he dug into the racial aspect of these uh, riots to a great extent. Why and did... he and he was uh, con he was well thought of. In fact, it was shortly after that was published that he was appointed uh, a, a judge, appellate court judge by Lyndon Johnson, probably um, in some way recognizing what uh, Kerner had done. And his indictment and his sentencing came after being a circuit court judge, or at least during that time. He died at age 67. What impact did the going to prison have on Otto Kerner? Well, Kerner always thought he was innocent, but you know, these many people, these many of these people always contended they were innocent. Uh, he felt like that he didn't do anything wrong. That they can that they're the transactions that uh, took place were illegal, were legal. And, uh, and he was, he, of course, when he was convicted, he uh, went through all of the appeals and they, uh, they, and, and he won nothing in the appeals. I think he, uh, he was embittered by uh, what happened. Uh, and, uh, and then he went to prison. And after uh, about 18 months or something, 
uh, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer and they uh, released him and he came back to Chicago and did some uh, charitable things before he died. What's your sense about it? Was he guilty? Well, I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, what he did was if he, he the, the transaction was probably uh, not illegal, but the payoff was did they did they do these things for Marge Everett for letting uh, for giving him this opportunity? It was the payoff I think that cost him. Dan Walker wrote a book after he was out of prison. He actually lived to be 92, but he wrote a book and we covered a news conference that he had. And I've got a couple of clips from the news conference and I want you to reflect on what you're hearing from Dan Walker. I deserve to go to prison because I violated the law. Yes, is the answer to that question. Yes. Did I deserve to go to prison in the big picture of things, taking into account what's called selective prosecution, or yes, political prosecution? The answer is no. It's very hard, folks, to say those two things. And all I can do is say each one of them and let you, those of you who read this book, make up your own mind as to whether I deserved to go to prison or not, given all of that situation. But please don't call me a grand thief, because I'm not, and I never have been a grand thief. Any reaction, Mr. Hartley? Uh, well, um, I, uh, of course, I read that book uh, as well, and I knew him uh, at a personal level when he was governor. and. Um, and that book, uh, yeah, I think it's important to know that uh, a lot of the book was uh, devoted to defending, not his prison uh, time, was uh, devoted to defending uh, his term as governor and his uh, war that he carried on uh, with Mayor Daley for uh, all of those years and ended up uh, uh, losing uh, an election because of Daley. And so a lot of that was uh, uh, getting back at things and repeating uh, hurts that he had uh, and bitterness that he had <clears throat> uh, extending from his, uh, his time as governor. Um, I, think, I, think he I think he believed, and I, I believe he, um, I believe he, if he didn't do, if he didn't just infer it, he may have said it. He felt that the federal uh, uh, prosecution of him for the uh, for the activities with the as the savings and loan, he felt that uh, Jim Thompson had uh, some influence in that. There was never any uh, any evidence of that. Thompson was governor uh, when that happened. Uh, the uh, the U.S. attorney in Chicago was a colleague of T Thompson when Thompson was U.S. attorney, and I'm sure that Thompson. And, uh, and the U.S. attorney conferred about what was going on, uh, whether he had any, uh, any, any influ influence in all of that uh, is a little hard to, uh, to well, it's impossible to uh, prove at all. But I think that, uh, that uh, um, Dan Walker felt that that was one of the reasons why he got the most serious, uh, more serious uh, outcome from, uh, pleading guilty than he deserved. Let's listen just to one more little clip of his news conference. I came very close to committing suicide. Uh, the loss of freedom is something that, that, that well, we talk about fighting and dying for freedom, right? We talk about that all the time. We have ever since our revolution back in 1776 fighting and dying for freedom. When you lose that freedom, particularly for somebody like me, I've always been a kind of a rebel, uh, and, and, and you lose that freedom, it, it, you, you really, well, that's it. And so I said, committing suicide is not seeking death, 
It's just stepping off into nothing, absolute nothing. And absolute nothing is is maybe better than this. Your reaction? Well, I think uh, Dan Walker, from the time he went to prison, he felt he was abused in prison. Uh, he, uh, of course, he lost his uh, license to practice law uh, with the conviction. Uh, that took away uh, a, a piece of his life of his uh, ability to make money, to earn a living. Uh, the years after he was uh, uh, in prison uh, were not particularly uh, uplifting. He had uh, a series of uh, jobs <clears throat> that, uh, in fact, one job that he had as a paralegal, he uh, performed rather well in California until they learned about all that had happened with him illegal illegally and they fired him, and he uh, he uh, he remarried, uh, and uh, and sort of lived his life out in uh, solitude, and uh, and and I think he lost everything. I think anything that he thought he had gained as a uh, as, let's say as a uh, successful businessman, as a governor and all, was lost, and so he was lost. And he kept up the effort to try to get his get his uh, license back, but he was never uh, able to do that. And I think it was a, just a pretty depressing period after all of that. George Ryan, <clears throat> what was his relationship with Big, as we used to call him, Big Jim Thompson, when he was governor? And these guys came up together. What what was their relationship as George Ryan ended up going to prison? Well, um, they were good friends, uh, and uh, Jim Thompson thought that uh, uh, in the one term that Ryan served, he thought he did a good job as governor. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, he, he of course, he, uh, he was responsible for promoting uh, Ryan in, uh, as lieutenant governor, as secretary of state. And uh, even though uh, Secretary of State is a constitutional office in Illinois, and the governor has no control over that, I think they work together no, nevertheless, and he certainly supported him when he ran for governor. And then when, uh, when the uh, prosecutors started after Ryan, um, Jim Thompson uh, stepped up. Uh, first of all, Ryan uh, asked for his help. Uh, and uh, Jim Thompson was the head of the uh, of a law firm in uh, Chicago, Winston and Strong, Strong, and uh, and he um, and he took over uh, the background of the defense for uh, for Ryan. Uh, he uh, he assigned the lawyer to uh, to work for uh, as to uh, <clears throat> to handle the defense, and Thompson. And uh, Ryan ran out of money to pay uh, for a legal help. And uh, Thompson, uh, as the CEO of his law firm, simply uh, swallowed all of that uh, cost, probably uh, estimated in the millions of dollars, to defend uh, Ryan as part of, uh, I think, his, uh, his faith in, in Ryan and his belief that he was innocent. And then... Uh, when uh, after Ryan was uh, convicted, uh, Thompson uh, got more active in trying to uh, find uh, to have the uh, the <clears throat> the results overturned on appeal. So he was a he was in he was a friend and a co and a, and then when uh, when uh, Ryan went to uh, prison, uh, he he <laughs> he was still in the background of Ryan's life. And uh, even even helped him get settled after Ryan got out of prison. It was amazing. I thought the uh, the time and effort and expense that Thompson uh, provided for a man who he thought was innocent. George Ryan's still alive, eighty nine years old. Do you have any idea what his life is like now? I have no idea at all. As far as I know, there's no. Uh, uh, no uh, discussion of it uh, in uh, the press. 
uh, I think he I think he simply settled back down and uh, and just uh, uh, lived uh, is living and he's still living and uh, uh, and and never surfaced again in any uh, public way. You've mentioned Mayor Daley a couple of times. We've got two Mayor Daleys. Which one did you cover the most of the two? The father or the son? The father. Did you know him? I interviewed him once. Um, <clears throat> to my knowledge, I was the only downstate uh, member of the press who ever uh, interviewed him in his office in Chicago. Uh, I spent a couple of hours with him. Uh, but that was the extent of my uh, awareness of him personally. What's the difference between living in Chicago and living downstate? Well, <laughs> uh, well, if you're living downstate in, in the time that I did, this is, uh, was still pretty much a Republican, in many ways, a Republican area. It was a, there was a balance uh, between the two uh, parties, even though... Uh, uh, even though Daley was uh, dominant in the Democratic Party and certainly in Chicago and in the legislature and so on, nevertheless, um, you uh, you uh, had an opportunity if you were downstate to get a picture that included uh, the Republican side of things or the uh, anti-Daley side of things, and. Uh, and then you, of course, knew uh, that you had to uh, work in the reality that Daley was running a lot of things out of Chicago. Any corruption with either Daley that you saw? No. How did they avoid it in a state that it seems to be so corrupt when you go mm -hmm. over the details like we've been doing? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, I think the a lot of things that happened that no one paid for, uh, meaning uh, paid for legally, um, simply was because they were uh, they were tolerated. I think there was a uh, a toleration, a, a sort of a tolerance for corruption uh, by by public officials uh, that uh, that permitted a lot of uh, shady activity and. Uh, and the people who were who were doing that were smart enough not to cross the line, for the most part, not to cross the line into something that would backfire on them legally. And I think the day I think Daly would fit into that rather well. I mean, we know that he controlled a lot of stuff, a lot of politics, a lot of maybe some elections too, uh, but. Uh, but n nobody was able to find they they put some of his aides. Uh, in prison, uh, but uh, but they never laid a hand on Daly. You know, we, we're talking about Governor Ryan. Um, we did not talk about the fatal crash in 1994, and the reason I bring it up is because I get the impression that that crash is what tipped off somebody about this, the licenses that uh, he was uh, uh, making money off of when he was Secretary of State. Do you are you aware of the 1994 crash? Uh, I am, and uh, I think that uh, there was a uh, there was for some reason, and I'm not sure that I know what it was. The federal government, I think it was uh, first of all uh, probably the IRS, <clears throat> but uh, at any rate, there because of uh, truck licensing and truck activity again is regulated at the federal level to a great extent even though there's a state activity i think they were uh, they were brought in uh, thinking that there was uh, something uh, something wrong and that's where the investigation began was as a result of that horrible accident that occurred and uh, exactly who it was that uh, started uh, started it with the feds uh, I, I'm not familiar with. But that was the beginning of the investigations that led to Ryan's uh, conviction. Rod Blagojevich was impeached by the legislature and then after that was indicted and after that went to prison. Did you have anything to do with that administration or had you left the state by then? 
I was not in Illinois at that time. I thought there was an interesting piece of the uh, Bogoyevich uh, situation with Jim Thompson. And uh, I think I wrote about that part in the, uh, <clears throat> in the Thompson story. Uh, after uh, Blagojevich uh, was elected and they, he began to run into some difficulty uh, legally and he could see some uh, problems ahead, he contacted, first of all, he asked uh, Thompson to, uh, to, be, uh, to help him uh, with, his, uh, uh, <clears throat> with the moving in to the office of governor and Thompson uh, did that. And then it was, uh, he went to Thompson and asked for legal, legal assistance. And uh, so the Winston and Strom uh, firm, again, that Thompson was heading, uh, took over um, uh, conferring and consulting with Blagojevich on his, uh, pro his uh, legal problems. Well, after uh, several months of that, uh, Blagojevich quit paying the bills and Thompson quit uh, uh, doing any help for Blagojevich. Thompson is is I, th I think is the intriguing part of a lot of this is that Thompson simply surfaces in a lot of what we've been talking about, not and and was never, to my knowledge, accused of any illegal illegal activity or corruption, uh, and neither was his the person that followed him was Jim De Jim Eager, uh, and so uh, I don't think uh, you know I think Thompson is a, that's one of the reasons why I think he was such a an incredible a public servant. But if you look back over the Kerner, Walker, Ryan, Blagojevich <clears throat> situation, or Mike Madigan for that matter, because he was the speaker what, of the House from 83 to 2021. Uh, well, he was, in the, he was in the Illinois House that long. I'm not sure he was speaker that long. But the point I want to get at is, how did these guys get caught? I mean, they were caught after they were out of office. What trips it, in your opinion? Well, I think uh, that uh, the the feds were um, alerted uh, one way or another. Um, for example, if you take uh, take Ryan, for example, now there's a, a, a biography of him. I didn't write it, but I read it, of course, that infers that the U.S. attorney uh, who was uh, in Chicago during the time of, uh, of Ryan's uh, uh, a work as Secretary of State, and even uh, in the first part of his uh, governorship, sort of turned a back and didn't pay much attention to what was going on and the uh, the investigations. Then they brought in this uh, new uh, U.S. attorney uh, with the Bush administration, and he had an entirely different look at this, and he was an aggressive uh, uh, and and successfully aggressive. Uh, U.S. attorney, and he he is the one who turned the heat up on Ryan. He also turned the heat up on Blagojevich, and so I think that what you uh, what you find is that there there may have been some investigations going on, but somebody had to take that information and turn it into a case against someone. Uh, they they obviously the feds found. That in uh, with Dan Walker, they found that uh, he had uh, done some things as the head of that savings and loan, and but the U.S. attorney had to take something from that. It wasn't just that investigation took place. So there was a U.S. attorney who who took after a Walker on that. I just think that this was a, a a sort of a process, and it was pretty much the same thing with Kerner. Um, he. Um, uh, the the the, the uh, Department of Justice took over the case in Washington. Uh, it was it was pretty touchy uh, taking on a sitting judge uh, as they did with Kerner. Uh, but uh, but Thompson uh, he was he was told by the people in the uh, in the Nixon administration. He was told it's your decision whether you're going to prosecute this man or not, and he made the decision. Thompson made the decision to prosecute Kerner. I should be sure to point out that Mike Madigan has been indicted, not convicted, 
and hasn't been tried yet. So I want to make sure that I'm, I think some of my language implies that uh, he's already been convicted. I want to make sure I make that clear. Let me, let me go back again to Kerner Walker, Ryan Bogoyevich, and for that matter, Dennis Hastert and Mike Madigan. All of these are federal indictments. They, when they are convicted, they go to federal prison. Where's the local? Where's the Illinois investigators in all this? And these guys became governors and this stuff happened but in some t- cases before they became governors. Why aren't the state prosecutors more active? Um, because they didn't want to be. Uh, that's my personal opinion. It was uh, a part of this a point I made about the tolerance um, that um, you, didn't, uh, you didn't rat out your, uh, your colleagues. Uh, you uh, you did what you could to protect them, actually, and uh, and if the when the feds then got involved, then the state people could easily back off and leave it up to the feds. Uh, but I believe it was part of the system of state government that over all of those years that simply permitted a thinking, a thought that we're not going to take on this person, this person who served as governor or served in the legislature or anything else. We're not going to prosecute them we're, because we we couldn't, maybe we couldn't even prove it, but anything against them. And so when the feds jumped in, then the state people could just simply back off. From what you know, uh, writing about all these politicians, the ones that went to prison, what's the impact on them? What happens to them? as they're in prison and then after prison? Well, I think their their reputation is destroyed. I think uh, whatever they might have accomplished as governor, I think is uh, put on the back shelf. Uh, they, uh, the focus is the fact that they committed uh, crimes uh, and that they went to prison and they served time. And I think that, uh, so I think that in, in, and then after they, of course, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Dan Walker uh, lost his uh, his right to uh, practice law. Uh, Kerner couldn't do that either. He lost his uh, seat on the uh, appeals court, uh, and uh, and so that was their life. Uh, that that was the life that they lived. That was the height of their um, of their prominence was serving as governor. And whether they were a good governor or not is really not in their minds. Whether what the what the this was all about, it was the fact that they were at the top of the heap, and they lost all of that, and they lost it immediately, and there was no recovery. You have a book out called Obsessed. Yes, just uh, published this summer. What's it about? It's about three U.S. senators from Illinois, all of whom served at approximately the same time. Uh, in the uh, 1960s, 70s, and 80s, all of whom uh, really wanted to be president of the United States. And uh, uh, they were Charles Percy, uh, Adlai Stevenson III, and uh, uh, Paul Simon, Senator Paul Simon. And uh, in some way or another, uh, they uh, pursued uh, uh, the, the possibility of being president. Now, that's not unusual among uh, public officials. There are probably a lot of people who thought they ought to be president. But Percy did uh, form an exploratory committee, and I think he would have run if it hadn't been for Nixon resigning and uh, Gerald Ford taking over as president. And uh, so it pretty much killed his chances of uh, becoming nominated in 76, in in 1976. Um, The only one of the three who actually conducted a campaign for president was Paul Simon. In 1987 and 88, he ran for the Democratic nomination. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> Iowa caucuses uh, where he um, finished a close second, but uh, he never recovered from that. But he, he did conduct a, uh, a, a viable campaign that at times was at the top of the polls. You've been a print journalist for years, ran newspapers. 
after all of the corruption that you've covered in Illinois and the governors that have gone to prison, the four that we talked about, and for that matter, the Speaker of the House, um, any impact on the local press there now? I know it's the press is you know, weaker than it's ever been and when it comes to newspapers, on covering people that are running for office uh, more vigorously than they did in the past after you see all these people have been in prison. Well, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that the press has uh, uh, has done much with it. I remember um, that um, uh, Paul Simon, when he was a state senator in 1965, he ran uh, published an article, wrote an article for Harper's Magazine about uh, alleging uh, corruption in the legislature, and um, and he was. Uh, he was shunned by the members of the legislature. His ideas for legislation never went anywhere. And uh, he was uh, he was called uh, Benedict Arnold. Um, and I think uh, that kind of uh, uh, backing up to support their f colleagues against uh, uh, accusations is an example. During that time period, uh, the with Chicago newspapers especially, uh, ran stories about they thought uh, about the th corruption they thought about in uh, in uh, the in the legislature particularly, but nobody investigated that to uh, any extent, and uh, the newspapers just wrote about it and, and you know they'd write an editorial complaining about somebody, uh, they would bring it up maybe in a campaign, but not in a way that uh, anyone could take it to the bank. <clears throat> so I think that that has prevailed. The press uh, would probably argue with that, but since I was a part of that, I, uh, I know that uh, it was very difficult to get past the, 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 get past the defenses, the defense system that the pu public officials put up uh, and uh, so they didn't uh, they didn't tip off their colleagues or even their opponents to any extent, and there wasn't much for the press to get a hold of. So, of all the twelve books that you've written, which one was the most popular in sales? Well, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the popular the most popular one actually uh, was uh, one that only touched on um, politics to a certain extent. I uh, co-authored a book on two coal mine disasters in Illinois, and it uh, involved politics at the highest level of the state. And it also involved uh, Adlai Stevenson's campaign for governor and uh, his terms in gov as governor. <clears throat> and this book uh, outsold uh, any of that I uh, published, with one exception, and that is a book that I wrote about uh, the time Lewis and Clark spent in Illinois. Uh, that was a self-published book that sold more copies than any book that I published elsewhere. Before I let you go, I've got to ask you that uh, on the page in your book where it gives all the titles of the books you've written, Chuck Percy, Jim Thompson, Paul Powell, on and on and on, I do not see the name Lincoln. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare <laughs> uh, write anything about Lincoln. Uh, they uh, they would run me out of the country if they. Uh, I have no credentials for that at all. Our guest has been Robert E. Hartley, and the book we've been talking about is Power, Purpose, and Prison, and it's all about the uh, imprisonment and uh, indictments and conviction of four governors from the state of Illinois. We thank you so much for your time, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Book Notes Plus. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. 
The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.